Hi, I'm Frank Lamb. Welcome to this Mastering the Machine Automation Academy video webinar from July 23rd, 2021. My guest today was James Dean, founder and president of Appalachian Automation. Hope you enjoy it. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, and actually kind of formally start this. This is uh, Mastering the Machine uh, webinar. I have a little group called Automation Academy. It's it's one of those membership groups. And uh, I joined another group called the Membership Academy that actually teaches you how to do this. And they said, you need to have events, right? Every every couple of weeks, do some kind of event, which is why I do this. It's a, in support of uh, this Automation Academy group I've got, which is a, it's just a website. You log in and you can download files and watch videos, things like that. Uh, when I started, I, I thought it was going to be PLC programming videos, right? So I made uh, PLC videos and I thought I might market those. And then people like Vlad Romanoff, who already has had that for three or four years, I realized they, you know, they've been doing this a long time, have a lot more of those videos than I do. So I kind of gave up on that and changed my focus to uh, systems integration and, and machine building, which is what I've done for most of my life, actually in East Tennessee, which is which is where James Dean there is from. Uh, I had a company out there from 96 to 2006 called Automation Consulting Services. And we did a lot of uh, machine uh, building with NAL Automation Systems, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with them, NAS, but they build a lot of packaging and process machines in East Tennessee, right where you're from, up in Johnson City and, um, Knoxville area, they do automotive work, that sort of thing. And so that's where that came from. And uh, then I started this little, this little Mastering the Machine webinar. It kind of evolved into this. Beginning of this year, I renamed it Mastering the Machine. And this is, uh, as I mentioned, the 14th Mastering the Machine video this year. I do them every two weeks. And it is the 21st uh, of this Automation Academy videos. And today, our guest, and our topic, Appalachian Automation, James Dean, and who is already on here, and we've already talked to a little bit. Um, and I copied this straight from your LinkedIn page, right? So boutique automation firm means you do a little bit of everything, right? Uh, serving yep. the Southeast region. Uh, I think you're located in, in uh, Greenville, Tennessee, or somewhere mm -hmm. close to it. You mentioned Rogersville also. PLC programming, panel building, uh, maintenance support, training, consultation, high-speed assembly, motion vision, packaging systems. And then I had a little fun with it. <laughs> James Dean, but not that James Dean. Right? <laughs> Rebel Man, if, I that, if I had that guy's look, I would be in there, right? <laughs> there, you, there you go. Uh, so I, I thought some of this stuff from your LinkedIn page was interesting. This must have been, like you said, when you get out of high school, 2000 to 2009, you were working... Uh, along kind of with your family, I guess, and started your own automation thing, right? Doing, doing that. Yes. Kind of stuff. Yep. That's correct. Yep. And then uh, some of these companies I recognize Sunoco, I just drove by them a few times, but team technologies, I remember they made toothbrushes, right? Um, among yep. other things. Yep. Uh, they, they're a, a full medical company now. And, and, you know, we'll go in depth about my experience with team and uh, you know, they're like family. They still are. Um, you know, Steve Hendrickson founded the company. Um, I went to work for him, you know, as, as an engineer, ended up being over five of his factories uh, in the in the controls and automation side of everything there. Um, you know, he, he really uh, he really took a chance on me. Like I said, I, you know, I'm not a degreed engineer. Um, so I, I can't call myself a, a controls engineer because I'm not. I'm a systems integrator, um, you know, but but he really he really um, took a chance took a chance on bringing me in and giving me a position to excel in. And, and, uh, then he sold the company off and, and one thing led to another, I got offered a, a really nice position with Rexel that you can see there. Um, but at the same time that, that I stepped into Rexel, I also started up Appalachian automation, um, for two reasons. The first reason was because working through Rexel, I was able to sell a lot of components, mostly Snyder. I did a lot of Snyder sales in square D. Um, but you know, my background since, I was a kid was uh was of course alan bradley and and a lot of automation direct coyo you know that that sort of thing and uh but what the problem was i had at rexel was um i could sell the products but no one in the east tennessee area really integrated them that well 
uh, there was a couple, a couple people that, that, you know, would, would talk to me and work with me. And, but that was about it. So, so I went to my manager and I said, look, you know, what's stopping me from doing these integrations after hours? And he said, well, we can't do that. You know, we're a distributor. And I said, well, I know you're a distributor, but I'm not. And, and so Appalachian Automation was born basically to do just VFD upgrades and drive upgrades and that kind of stuff. But what I found is that I started reaching out to clients from my previous tenure with Dean Industrial Group, which was my company. Um, you know, what I found was that, man, I had a lot of clients who still wanted to work with me and really hated it that, that we went by the wayside. Um, and before long, it was, it was time to jump back in, you know, wide open. And uh, I had to weigh the pros and cons. And, and I, I mean, I still buy from, from Rexel uh, today. Those guys are like family to me. Um, I can call them right now and tell them I'm in a bind and, and they will work every which way possible to, to help me solve it for my clients. Um, we have a, uh, almost loyal to a fault, I guess is the best way I can put it. Um, my client base is very loyal to me and I'm very loyal to, to, to my vendors and suppliers. Um, it takes a lot to earn my business, but at the same time, once you earn it, um, I don't do price shopping. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I expect to get a, a discount or a deal because I'm a systems integrator, but I'm not going to send something out. I don't have the time to send something out for four or five quotes every time we do a system or whatever. And, and I believe in a partnership that, uh, that's built on trust. And that's what those guys bring to the table. They're not always the cheapest. Um, and sometimes they drop the ball. I mean, nobody's perfect, especially in the COVID world. But what I do get there is a guy at the other end of the phone that when he, when he hears the pain in my voice, because I'm struggling with something, I can trust that he's going to do everything in his power to solve it for me. And, and that means a lot to me. So, um, you know, I don't believe in burning bridges. Team Technologies is still, like I said, they're, they're like family. Um, you know, Marshall White, the CEO, I'm starting to call Marshall now and, and say, Marshall, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking to do something or, or I've got guys that are idle. Do you have anything that, that could happen? And I'm sure he would say, yeah, we've got, you know, we've got something that we can use your guys on. So I don't believe in burning any bridges from the past. Um, I actually worked for Team Technologies twice. I need to update that. I didn't realize it wasn't on there, but um, I actually did another stint with Team Technologies uh, for about a year um, in the middle of, of getting Appalachian Automation up and going and stuff. I took a, a contract role there, you know, uh, again, to to kind of just sort of buy the time while we were, you know, capital, capital deprived, I guess you'd say, you know. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so, and, you know, if you go back to, to Dean Industrial Group, basically – you know, I grew up, I graduated in 2000. So I'm still, uh, I'm still a, a little, uh, a little young on that side of things, I guess. But, but, um, I, you know, I grew up in a family business that did automation. So at uh, 11, 12 years old, I was helping build control cabinets for my dad. Um, he was an old school electrician, you know, old school relay logic, that kind of stuff. PLCs. He got to where he was a pretty good PLCs guy. Um, but he really pitched, pitched it to me at a young age and said, learn this you know, and, and he backed me with whatever I needed. And, and, um, so by the time I graduated high school, I was, you know, I was, uh, 17, 18 years old and already had a, a really good foundation for a career, worked with him strictly, but I had no idea about business, how to run a business. I didn't know how to quote a job. Uh, you know, any of that, I just worked for my dad. I mean, essentially he was my only client and, and things were good and he paid me well and, and, um, you know, everything was okay. So, but in 2002, um, right when I was about 20, he had a horrific car wreck and uh, he was out of commission for, you know, almost eight months. He was in a coma for several months in a wheelchair. I mean, it, it really shut us down. And, and all of a sudden I had to, um, I had to learn a lot really quick. I didn't know who our clients were. I didn't know how to quote a job. I didn't know how to order parts. I didn't know any of that. Cause I was just a technician. So, um, but my dad needed medicine. You know, he, he was in the hospital and he needed, he needed, when he come home, he had a, a lot of infections and stuff. He broke 43 bones on his left side. And, and, uh, it was, it was amazing that he survived it. Um, so when that happened, you know, I, I, I had to survive, but I also had to, had to help him survive. So, um, uh, so I, I learned really quickly how to do that side. And, and that's where the, the idea of going to business school come from. Cause I thought, man, you know, I've got these guys working for me and, and I know how to build a cabinet, but if I can't sell it, and it, even if I do sell it, if I can't manage the money on the other side, you know, then, then we're in trouble. So, uh, so I decided, you know, later that, that was 2002 when he had his wreck. So once he got back on his feet and we kind of got out of the fire, I guess you'd say, uh, then I decided to, to, to try to get a formal education in business and go that route. Um, 
and I got what I needed out of it. Like I said, I, I you know, I, I didn't finish, I didn't finish the degree because I, I was two and a half, almost three years in and realized that um, it was a real waste of my time setting through the, the end of the courses that I had left because my phone, my phone was ringing with clients every day wanting me to come and look at this project or do this job for them or quote this or whatever. And I'm sitting in some elective course, uh, you know, and I can't answer the phone because I'm listening to a professor speak on whatever subject matter may be. And it just come to a point where I realized that this, this was insane. Um, I'm going in debt, you know, to, to take, to take these, take these classes. And, uh, and I've got a guy calling me wanting to spend a hundred grand with me or 200 grand with me to do a project. And I'm rejecting his phone call to listen to a guy talk about something I really don't, don't care a whole lot about. So, um, so basically, you know, hmm. I decided that it was time to move on with my life. And, and that's what I did. And, and, uh, you know, I'm not saying that's for everybody. I'm not, I'm not there going to tell anybody to drop out of school and stop their education. That's insane. But, um, but it was, it was best for me at the time. I had a foundation in under me and a, co and a company in under me, but, um, so we made great money, uh, you know, up until 2007, uh, everything was booming. My dad and my uncles, we were in business together. Um, of course I had Dean industrial group and then my dad was Dean electronics. And then my uncles had Dean brothers electric. So there was three different entities there. Um, but in 2008, my uncle Jerry, uh, suddenly passed from a stroke and, uh, about that was in September, I want to say. And then in October, my uncle Charles's liver failed. And then on Thanksgiving, my dad had a massive stroke. So, um, it, it left me with trying to run all of this, um, you know, and I was 20, I guess I was 25 at the time, something like that, 26. Uh, and, and it left me just really, um, really in a bind because I, I had all these, all this work to do. And then the double whammy hit with the economy crashing. Um, you know, and I remember we had a, a contract with a battery company. I won't name the name of the company, uh, cause somebody ended up suing me because but um, we had a contract with a battery company for about $3 million and, and they had paid some deposit money and stuff, but we had ordered, um, it was, it was about three quarters of a million dollars worth of Rockwell equipment, um, you know, panels and cabinets and PLCs and all stuff that we had, that we had ordered. And then they went bankrupt and uh, nullified the POs. So we were left stuck with, you know, having all that on our, on our, um, uh, on our, our capital and, and, uh, you know, on our lines of credit and stuff and, and that along with some other jobs. That, I mean, I think, I, I don't remember exactly the, but I, I want to say it was something like six or $7 million worth of POs that we had canceled in a three month period. Um, that was work that was scheduled to be done. So it, it on top of having my family collapsing on me and passing away and, and not, well, not passing away. My uncle Jerry was the only one that passed away at that time, but my dad was on about a, a second grade level after that. He, he was really, really struggling just to, to do basic functions. Uh, and my uncle Charles, he, he made it for a couple more years before he finally passed, you know, by being able to go through dialysis and things like that. But, um, it, it was, uh, it was just a bad situation to be in, you know? So I ended up leaving, but what I found was, um, when I, you know, when we shut down in, in the start of 09, um, my wife and I, we had just been married. We got married in 2007 and, and, uh, you know, I went from, from mid six figure incomes, you know, 300, 400,000 a year. Uh, to bankrupt in a matter of, you know, a year and a half because the income stopped. And when you're 25 or 26, um, you do stupid things with money. I still do stupid things with money. I still buy race cars and blow engines up and all this stuff. You know, I mean, everybody has their hobbies, but yeah, there you go. So there's, there's some of my, there's some of my toys that, that I use. Um, but uh, the camper actually is a smart one, believe it or not. I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit uh, when I get into talking about why I do some of the things I do. The Camaro is a complete waste of money. Absolutely a complete waste of money. But there's nothing funner than that picture on the left that's taking place there. So, um, but yeah, so when I was 25 or 26, you, you don't think about, um, you don't think about all of a sudden one day you wake up and, and the money's gone. Like everything's gone. You know, we were doing great work. We, we worked our butts off. We, um, we all helped each other on each other's projects. Um, we were very efficient because we had, you know, my, my uncles were in the millwright business. So they did a lot of machine uh, moving, a lot of machine setup and stuff. Um, Dad and I were in the controls business. So what that gave us the opportunity to do is cross sell, uh, which we can talk about shortly, you know. Um, but basically, 
my uncles would go out and, and start to move a machine and they say, hey, you know, while this thing is down, while we've got it down for this month, why don't you bring it to our shop and let our controls guys go through it? And that way you're coming out the other side with a brand new piece of equipment. And we, just like I am now, we were a budget oriented controls company. I'm doing that same exact thing today. And we'll discuss that more in depth shortly. But um, so that really worked for us. So, so we fed off of each other's, um, uh, you know, specialties, I guess you'd say. And you don't expect that to end all of a sudden. So, um, you know, I think in 2007, when my wife and I got married, we took a six week honeymoon to the Keys. You know, just, I mean, life was really good, especially for a 25 year old who didn't really earn the right to have that kind of lifestyle. Um, life was really good for us. And then all of a sudden it wasn't, and it was really bad. So I had to step back out into a, uh, into a world of um, not having an, engin an engineering degree and not having any real formal training and trying to explain to companies why they should hire me for a maintenance job at $15 an hour or whatever, when I show them, cause, cause I don't want to lie to anybody. So they would say, well, you know, what was your income at your previous job? You know, 350 a year, you know? And they're like, well, how in the world does none of this make sense? I'm like, yeah, you're, you're telling me none of it makes sense at all, but, uh, but I'm starving and I've got, you know, a baby on the way and you know, what do we do? So, um, so a small company in East Tennessee who's not listed on here uh, called uh, La Casera Mexicana. It's a LQM. It's a small cheese factory in Greenville. Um, Jake Gibbs, who is still there now, and Blake Johnson, the president of the company, um, they, I met with them, and I just flat out told them, guys, look, you know, this is what happened. Uh, I've got the skill set to do what you need to do, but I've got a wife, and I've got a, a son on the way, and, uh, you know, I, I need I need to work. and of course they said, you know, there's no way we can pay you what you're used to, what you're used to earning. And I said, guys, look, it's, it's 2009 and every, I need to work. So if you guys can put me to work, I would really appreciate it. And they did. And, um, so they put me to work and, uh, I mean, it was terrible pay and it was long hours, but they still, to this day, I was there yesterday morning at three o'clock starting a drive for them. They've been clients for years. They don't, and when you hear me in the video, uh, some of the videos that you were speaking about on YouTube that I put on there, some of the stuff I've talked about uh, in the past, um, you hear me talk about a cheese factory, and you hear me talk about some of these clients that have been with us for decades that that don't even quote with anybody else. Now, they, they don't send anything else out to quote. That's one of them, because they know, and I say it over and over, those guys saved me from, from being destitute. They saved my life. And um, so when they call... I don't care what's going on. If they, if my phone rings, I will be there. That's just the way it is, period. And they know that, but I also know that, that anytime they need something done, I'm their guy. I don't have to worry about competing there. I won't take advantage of them. They know that. And uh, like I said, yesterday morning at, at three o'clock, you know, two thirty, three o'clock, I was there swapping out a drive for them um, that had failed. And they had a, they had a, a, a vat full of about $50,000 worth of, worth of cheese that they were going to lose if we couldn't get it going. And so they called and woke me up and I climbed out of bed and that way I went, you know? Um, so, so yeah. So when, when you look at, at where I come from up to now, you know, there's going to be a ton of people who see this that are way more pedigreed than, than what I am. Um, I don't at all pretend to be something that I'm not, um, you know, you're going to have guys with PhDs and masters and, and MBAs and stuff. And I, I am none of those things, but what I am is, is I'm a guy who's lived every, uh, every bit of turmoil and success through being a small business owner that you possibly can. And I think I've learned from that now to the point to where, you know, we're pretty, we're pretty solid now. We, um, you know, we're a three to a $5 million company. Um, we're not a monster monster integrator. We never will be, uh, like I said, you know, we will be somewhere, you know, at the end of this year, I plan to be somewhere around six to 10 employees. And probably a crew of 20 to 25 that we use a lot that are the rest are contractors that that uh, I have really good relationships with. Um, if you've heard me talk before about collaboration, uh, I don't believe in competition at all anymore. Uh, I think competition when we're when we're kids and we're talking about uh, you know baseball or football or basketball, um, you know we're taught about competition and, and the strongest survive and that kind of thing. And we go into the workforce thinking the same thing. If you look around nine out of 10 people believe they're competing for some magical ring when they go to work. And, uh, and what I found, um, you know, through trial and error is that that doesn't really work. Uh, collaboration goes a long way. Um, now, you know, we still obviously have to compete for, for jobs and compete for contracts and that kind of thing. But at the same time, 
Uh, you know, I'll give you an example. We, we just come off of a, a long project in Huntsville, Alabama for Toyota. Uh, we were there for about six months and, um, and we ended up, you know, taking some work that, that other people had quoted because they, they didn't have time to fill the role. But at the same time, we made some contacts where we were able to shift some of our work to other guys while we were there um, because they were better suited for it. You know, it, it was something that we, once we got there and realized the scope of work that was there, some of it we were really qualified for, and some of it we were going in uh, a little bit naive about some of the some of the um, some of the different processes and stuff that they had there. So we actually internally just decided to shift some of that around ourselves. And I don't know that other other businesses would do that, but for us it made sense. Even though we didn't we didn't make anything off of shifting that work over, it allowed it allowed us to be more efficient with what our crew could do. And what that gave us is um, there's another project coming up in. Uh, in last of September, 1st of October that we're going to start. And it's a, another several month project. But when I started speaking to them about that and quoting it, they said that Appalachian Automation was one of the top ranked uh, vendors that they had on that project in Huntsville as far as feedback goes and all that, uh, you know, that, that we, we came highly, highly recommended for our skill set and what we could do. And I truly believe that had we not shifted some of that work like we did uh, and brought in some of our contracting partners who, really are competitors to us in day to day, but they're competitors in a, in, I guess, in a friendly manner. We're not out to slit each other's throats every day, but that allowed us to, to really excel at what we were doing. So, and, and we can get into more of that in a little bit, but, but basically, uh, you know, that's from there till now and uh, where we're at as far as Appalachian automation goes. And, uh, you know, we're looking to grow more and, and, um, and become a little bit larger, but not much. You know, I, I get a lot of people that's out there, and their dream is to be the next Amazon or the next Google or whatever. And that's fantastic for them, but that's not us. That's not what we want to be at all. So, uh, you know, with that, I'll, I'll uh, turn it over for another question if you got, but that kind of sums up what you've got on the screen there. So. Yeah. Well, a lot of times I think, uh, like you said, you give up a lot, right. When you, um, decide that you want to be the next Amazon, all of a sudden you find that that's all you're doing. And there is, you know, there is a work-life balance, and that goes back to this question here. I noticed you post some things about uh, your race cars, and you go up to, uh, it said your family, does your family actually own a racetrack up there? They do, uh, yeah. So I have uh, I have a cousin um, who owns the, the local track here in Rogersville called Cherokee Dragway. Um, and I, I drag race for years with my dad. And when my dad passed, uh, well, not when he passed, but when he got sick, um, I, I really didn't want to do it anymore. You know, uh, it was, it was pretty lonely. And, uh, so long story short, I sold everything out. And, and then about a, a year ago, year and a half ago, my wife and I started talking and I said, you know, I'm at a point in life now to where I remember the memories I had growing up with my dad racing from the time I was nine years old. Some of the best memories that we have together came at the racetrack, not to mention that you learn a lot, uh, mechanical, electrical, you know, you learn a lot in the racing field. You, you develop, you know, a technical skill set, but you also learn how to deal with people and you learn, um, you learn competition. You know, you learn, like uh, I always said, if you want to see how a business should be managed, go to a racetrack on a Saturday night, because what you'll see, and I've posted videos about it, is um, you'll see the number one and the number two guy in points jump in and help each other to get the car going so that one of them can go beat the other one. You know, so they are absolute competitors on the racetrack, but at the same time, they're best friends or, or they're good friends when they're not going down the drag strip. Um, you know, John Force talks about how he runs against his daughters and runs against his son-in-law. And, and you know, one of the things he talked about is, is I want to beat them and they want to beat me. But, to, but we know that by beating each other, it brings us to a level of excellence, right? So... So I decided, uh, you know, year before last, I was going to get back into racing. I always loved Camaros, always one of the third gen. I grew up, you know, watching the, you know, like the, you know, Lee Shepard and those guys run. And uh, when I was young in, in pro stock and, and pro mod, Scotty Cannon was my hero. I, I know a lot of guys won't know that name, but in the drag racing world, he was my hero growing up. And uh, and I always had a, a, a passion for third gen Camaros. I always wanted a third gen Camaro. Um, and this one was available, so I decided it was time to pull the trigger and there it is. So uh, that's kind of kind of my hobby now, and it's it's a it's an insane expensive hobby to have, and um, I, I could probably 
probably have a drug habit and it would be cheaper than that right there. But um, I don't know if it'd be as fun. So do you actually haul that car uh, behind that, that RV or how do you, how do you get it to the. No. So, so the RV uh, right now is actually parked at the drag strip permanently um, or at least for the season. So I've got a spot for it. And then we, because the drag strip is only about 30 minutes from my house. And then we haul the race car. I've got a stacker trailer that we put, I actually have two race cars. I have the Camaro, but I also have a dragster as well, one of the rail cars. Um, so we haul those back and forth, you know, on the weekends. And, and then we uh, we go over on Thursday night usually. Um, right now we're not going because I'm waiting on an engine. I blew my engine, so I'm more money spent, you know. Uh, so I'm waiting on the engine to get here. But uh, we typically go over on Thursday nights and just stay from Thursday till Sunday. Uh, the kids have their friends there that, you know, um, we, we test on Friday nights and then race on Saturday uh, like I said, Randy, the, the track owner, is family. So on Sunday mornings, we get up and and uh, there's nobody there. It's quiet time. And, you know, we'll get up and have coffee and, and cook breakfast and just enjoy, you know, some camaraderie before we head out Sunday to come home, before the week starts back again. Uh, you know, so it, it's just a way of unwinding and, and kind of uh, getting your mind off of things. But but I think we're all inflicted. If, if you're in this business, be it mechanical engineering or electrical engineering or computer programming or any of that, we're all inflicted with this disease that we can't stand not to tinker on something. Um, you know, before I was drag racing, I was in the home automation and home theater. I got into that pretty good and, and, uh, automated everything. And, you know, um, I was just bored out of my mind. You know, you sit around and if I'm not working, then I'm still wanting to work. So, uh, so yeah, so this, this is, uh, my new outlet, I guess, to, to focus some of that energy on when I, you know, when we're not absolutely slammed with work. So. Well, and it's an opportunity to spend time with your family too, which is, uh, that, that's important. I, I went through some of the same stages where I was working six, seven days a week and not seeing, I mean, I, I was there for my kids when they had events and things like that, but if they weren't doing something, I was, you know, uh, and, and so I had some hobbies. Um, also, I think I put some of them up here. You notice my family's all here. Now I got four grandkids. And I play music and do a lot of travel and other things. But uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, uh, do here, uh, because some of the people have logged in specifically to get business advice, they want to learn from your experiences and some of my experiences of what we did, maybe wrong even when we started our businesses. Um, one of the, I started this list, but I can actually type new things on this list if you come up with some good things that I can leave up here. I started my business literally in my garage and I moved out too early. I went out and I hired people. And as I mentioned, I grew that company to about 15 people and uh, found myself herding cats and ended up closing the business 2006. But if I would have stayed in that garage, probably six months longer, I wouldn't have had the debt that I incurred by going and renting an office and hiring people. So sometimes, uh, you know, one of the things I've advised some people to do is start part time, right? And you mentioned you were working for Rexel. We have a lot of things in common. I work for Roden Electric. Uh, they're now Kendall uh, mm -hmm. and they're the Allen Bradley distributor. And you were working for Schneider distributor who, interestingly enough, uh, Rexel is the Allen Bradley distributor in Miami. So when yeah. I go down there, that's who I deal with to buy my, I have to buy my Allen Bradley from there. Uh, but that's where I got some of my customer connections. And I imagine you may have done the same. You'd go visit people, you'd see their plants, you'd see what they had in there. They'd ask you for some help. And that's how, you know, that's sometimes how you get leads. And that's, that's where I started before I ever started my business was working for the distributor and meeting a lot of different people in factories and doing little jobs for them on the side. So that, that was, I guess, where I'd start my list if I had to advise people stay in the garage longer. Don't run up a big debt. You know, dad will kill you, which you absolutely. Uh, I a hundred percent agree. Um, you know, we just now, I mean, literally we take possession August the 1st. We just now leased a new facility. We've been working, um, you know, in, in small rented areas when we needed it. Um, but we just now have a facility coming that is going to be our home office. Um, because honestly, I think too many people get jaded on what they think their client wants. Um, now it may be different if you're dealing with large scale uh, manufacturers or large scale clients, you know, if, if you're dealing with, you know, Walmart or, or somebody like that that has these monster companies, then they may want to see the pedigree 
in person. They may want to see, you know, your 50,000 square foot air conditioned panel shop or what, you know, I don't know. But what I found um, and what's always worked for me, we, we service uh, the, 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 the small, your 50 to 100 employee factories, your mom and pop companies. Um, that's our target market. We, we are a budget automation company. Now, when I say budget, I don't mean that we're doing things cheap. But what I mean is we're budget conscious on what they want to accomplish, and we try to give them the best economical option that they can, right? But I've never had someone say, uh, well, if you don't have a 100,000 square foot facility, we can't do business with you. you know, it's just not something that's a way. So what I think happens with a, a lot of younger people, or a lot of, not younger people, but a lot of inexperienced people trying to get into the business is the first thing that they think is they have to I guess fake it until you make it is the term, right? So I guess that's the 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 thing, and I'm sure you, I've been guilty of it as well. Uh, you know, I remember I went out, the dumbest thing I ever did, um, it's a little bit off topic on what you're talking about the garage, but I'll put it out there. I went out and I bought a uh, 650i BMW convertible. You know, it's $100,000 sports car. Because I thought, man, you know, if I pull up to a client's shop, um, you know, they're going to be amazed by this sports car. What Ironically, what I found when I, when I pulled up to a client's shop in that sports cars, they thought that I was charging them too much to be able to buy the sports car. So sometimes those things are not, uh, are, are not looked at the way you think they are. So now I drive, I mean, it's, it's a really nice Chevy Dually, but I drive a, a Chevy pickup just like everybody else does. Um, and you saw it in the picture with the camper behind it, you know, but, um, but yeah, so, so I absolutely agree. I, we, we try to run as debt free as we can. Now we do have a couple credit cards that we, uh, that we put all of our stuff on to make it easy, but it gets paid off every month. We don't let, we don't let interest accrue on it. Um, and then we use a lot of those points and perks to fly our guys around. You know, I'm going to take our whole team. Um, well, depending on the COVID Delta variant, all this is going on. We're hoping to go to uh, uh, the show. Oh, it's a packaging show. I don't remember the name of it. Holly, my wife uh, is booking all, but next month in September in Vegas, they're having the, you know, the packaging show out there. And uh, I'm planning on taking my guys and, and uh, my whole team and, and their spouses and going to Vegas and doing the show. Um, you know, and we do that with the points and stuff we earn from, from using the cards. So, so, I mean, there's some, there's some ways that you can manage uh, to take on some debt that makes sense. But, you know, on these shops that, that we just acquired, um, in, we, didn't, we didn't take those shops on until we had enough money in the bank um, to pay the lease out in full. So tomorrow, if something happened, um, we could write a check and pay out the, the entire lease, which is about a quarter of a million dollars. You know, we could just pay the lease out and go on and, and we wouldn't miss it. I mean, it's not gonna hurt us. It's not gonna bankrupt us. It's, there's, no, there's no problem there. So I absolutely agree with you 100% in that you don't have to, if you, if you tell people up front that you're this monster organization, they're going to come to expect that. But if you tell people up front that, that you are just getting started or whatever, they're going to expect that, but it's not going to stop you from losing. It's not going to stop you from losing clients or it's never stopped me from losing clients. Um, if you go in, I had a meeting yesterday, for example, I met a new client uh, in Kingsport that does some filtration systems for the wastewater. I, I never met the gentleman. Um, he actually wrote me on LinkedIn and, and wanted to know if I could swing by and talk to him. And absolutely. So I went and met with him, had a great meeting. Hopefully that's going to turn into some business for us. But um, one of my employees went with me and he, he hasn't really accompanied me on a lot of sales calls and stuff. And he said, wow, he said, you know, one thing I noticed was at the start of the conversation, those guys were dictating to you um, what their control systems were. By the end of the conversation, you were teaching those guys what their control systems needed to be. And he said, I could see a change happening from the professional in the room changed all of a sudden. Now, I'm not a specialist at all in wastewater product. And I told him that. I said, guys, I, the, your process is, I've done wastewater stuff and I know some of it. Your process is not where I'm going to be a, special to, a specialist at. But if you tell me what you want to accomplish and how you want to accomplish it, we will do the best we can to provide you a system that is economical, that has the functions you need, and maybe we can recommend some functions that you don't even know exist yet. So one of the things I showed them, I don't know if, if you guys have seen it, but um, Snyder has a product called the Tesis Island, which is a remote IO rack for contactors. And it's one of the most brilliant products that we've used. Uh, it's something we really, we really enjoy integrating. Um, it's made our, our panel builds go, um, 
you know, thirty percent less expensive and about fifty percent less time consuming to build a cabinet when you have multiple starters and stuff. Um, so it's so it's been a really good product for us. But uh, you know, I explained to them what we could do to be able to monitor the motors and stuff in their system uh, and get that data out. You know, there's that key word again, data that, that that I'm not an expert at, but but we're able to get some data out and really start monitoring for things like preventative maintenance and stuff. Um, you know, we can extract that and and give it to them, and and it costs the same as a contactor. And it costs less to install it than what a normal contactor would, right? Um, because you don't have the extra I.O. wiring and things. So uh, so anyways, that was one of the things that he said was, um, you know, he was amazed how that conversation quickly changed from, you know, who was the, not the leader in the room, but who was the professional in the room. By the end of the conversation, they were listening instead of talking. And uh, and sometimes that's a good thing. So I hope we get to do business with them. Um, but, but yeah, you know, I, I think, they didn't ask me a single time about uh, about my shop or, or you know, my, my pedigree or my cars or whatever. Uh, we talked a little bit about football, but that's about it. Um, so, so yeah, I actually I actually 100% agree with what you're saying there about, about staying in the garage longer, for sure. Uh, would you say uh, networking is probably the main key to getting business then? Absolutely. Uh, hands down, I mean, you know, Cold calling and and you know printing out flyers and sending flyers or or whatever, um, you know, those things those things work, but you have to really work hard at it to get them to work. You know, that's something. I mean, a cold call. Uh, if you pick a client, you know, out of the phone book and you decide that hey, I'm gonna book, I'm gonna get in touch with these guys, um, it may take twenty or thirty different attempts to get your foot in the door to even have a conversation. And then those people are still going to be very skeptical of what they're getting. But when you start networking out there, um, you know, and, and you start meeting people on terms different than work. Uh, for example, I love the university of Tennessee football. Um, it's hard to say that right now, but the university of Tennessee football is absolutely terrible. Um, but I'm a huge UT fan. I have been. I have been since I was, you know, since I was a kid, and and uh, so we try to attend every ball game. We go everywhere we can with them. We travel with the team when we can. Um, so one of the things that we've learned over the years is that while we're there, usually somebody to the left or right of us is going to be in some kind of industry. I mean, they. It's just you know, it's there. So. When you're at an event, now I'm not saying go out there and sales pitch to people. You know, you don't want to be out there handing out business cards looking like a used car salesman. I mean, no offense to used car salesman. But um, but when you start having those conversations, inevitably there will come an opportunity where you can say, I provide this service. This is or you might even get asked, what is it that you do? You know, and that gives you an opportunity to have that conversation. And it's amazing if you focus on networking that way all of a sudden you start building contacts and you immediately start building trust around a common area, um, be it sports fishing, you know, drag racing for, for a long time. And I still, I still am interested in it. I've really been wanting to get a, a small plane, like a Cessna, you know, that kind of thing that my family can use to travel. Cause one of the things I'm sure that you're aware is um, there comes a time when you own a business to where um, money becomes less of a, an issue and time becomes way more of an issue. So, if you listen, I don't know how many of you guys know Grant Cardone, but Grant Cardone's a, a, a mentor that I look at. And, and I'm not at all telling you to go spend $30,000 on a, on a, on a uh, consulting, what is it, the, the things he does with the expos and stuff. I'm not at all telling you to do that. I will tell you that some of his books, the 10X Rule, um, those books are phenomenal books. So if you wanted to read those books, by all means, I would say buy them and read them. I don't think anybody on earth is worth spending $20,000 for a weekend to listen to him speak. Um, if I did, I would go out there and say that. But one of the things that Grant Cardone says in his books is when he was looking at buying his first jet, his first private jet, he went to some of the richest people he knew. And he said, here's the thing is, the accountants that I'm paying, you know, that are making 100000 a year or whatever, they're telling me that a jet doesn't make sense. And, he, and then he turns around and he says, but the richest people I know are telling me it's the single best thing that they ever did. But he doesn't really go into the books as to why that is, right? And he said, you can't make it make financial sense. And you can't. But the reason why it doesn't have to make financial sense to somebody who is who is wealthy is because money is no longer the issue. Time is right. So and I'm no means by any means wealthy like that. Now, you know, I'm not buying a private jet. I'm talking a little 1963 Cessna here, you know, that you can pick up for the, for the cost of an SUV. But what it does give is it gives time um, for me to go visit clients and then also time for me to be able to get my family 
um, to, to a place that we want to go and, and not have that eight or nine hour drive time or sitting in an airport. I mean, if you look now, by the time you go through security and stuff in an airport and you go and have your layovers and stuff, about anywhere you're going to go in a regional area, you could have drove it in the same time. I mean, it saves you from holding a steering wheel, but you're still spending five or six hours to get somewhere, you know. So, um, so yeah, so uh, if, if you get out on the networking side of things, we went to um, – the reason why I brought up the airplanes thing is we went down to Tampa uh year before last – before COVID, 2019. We went down to um, Sun and Fun, Fun and Sun. It's the big air show that's down there. And um, I took my son because he wanted to see the Blue Angels. So we went down, and I was looking to just learn more about the airplane community, just what it is. And while we were there, we networked with two or three different people that have now become friends and clients. And, you know, and, and it was just as simple as, hey, what do you do for a living? And, and I tell them I do automation. They're like, really? Well, I'm in manufacturing and blah. And, and it's an organic thing. So, so, you know, read all the sales books you want, and they're going to teach you to cold call and do all these things. But no one who is really, no one who is really succeeding at a high level in sales, no one is doing it on a strictly cold call basis. I mean, you've got to get your name out there. You've got to go out there. When you're getting in business, uh, you have to go knock on doors. Uh, if you're not knocking on doors or dialing numbers or on LinkedIn trying to send a message, you know, um, by the way, if you're on LinkedIn and, and you immediately friend me and then you send me a message wanting to do business with me, I'm going to reject you right away. Um, but but over time, I mean, there's there's um, there's a few people on there that I've become really close with that I'm going to send business to or I have sent business to and do business with because they built that relationship the right way. They commented on my post. We got to conversate and we learned a little about a little bit about each other. And then we eased into that relationship of doing business, you know, Um so, if, you know, if you're if you're new to business, you have to network, but at the same time, network around a way that 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 everyone um, that is around you has a, a common interest of some sort. And it, it, I don't care what it is, fishing, golfing, I'm not a golf guy, but, you know, that that's an easy way to build everything. So what was the name of the book that Grant Cardone you mentioned? Uh, the, it's called the 10X Rule. Um, and, and it is a phenomenal, phenomenal book. Um, the two books that I would tell, if, if I was going to tell uh, a, a new business person books to read, the, the two books I would recommend, um, and you can pick them up on Amazon, they're dirt cheap, is The 10X Rule by Grant Cardone and then The One Thing by Gary Keller. So Gary Keller is uh, CEO of Keller Williams Realty, which I think is now the largest real estate company in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I was an agent for Keller Williams when I parked my license when I, when I was doing real estate. Um, and you know, I never, I, I, I would never went into real estate to be a real estate agent. I went into real estate to learn the business of selling and contracting as we talked about earlier. But, um, but Gary Keller was somebody who, who I had read about long before I started out with century 21 and I had started reading about Gary Keller and he was in Texas out that area. And, and I read his first book was the, was the millionaire agent. And that's really geared towards real estate. So I, I'm not going to recommend that for, for everybody, but he, he then turned around and wrote the one thing. And if you read those two books, what those two books are going to teach you is how to focus on what actually matters in the one thing. Um, and then the 10 X rule is going to teach you how to achieve your goals in a way that pretty much makes it foolproof that you cannot miss from achieving your goals. And I'll let people develop their own, their own idea on those two books as to what they think. And, and I'm not telling you that they won't be some cheesy sales pitches and stuff in them because because it is. I mean, some of it is is, you know, it's sales talk. But if you read those books or and both of them are available on audio, if you listen, I listen to a lot of books because I drive a lot. So you can get them both on Audible. But, um, yeah, phenomenal books that will help anybody take that next step for sure. So you mentioned driving places. Uh, it's interesting. I see Carlos Colon is on here and uh, I drive to Miami, I don't know, six, seven times a year. And I visit Carlos on the way down. Uh, so that's how I met him, slow networking. And we've met a couple times down there. And last time, got to meet his wife and hang out. And uh, a lot of times, that's where some of that those connections come from. Uh, does anybody on here, I notice there are, let's see, currently about 14 people on here. I can't see who's who. But does anybody have a question for James uh, about business? I can, I, I can throw in a question. 
Uh, really appreciate uh, your thoughts, James, on, on the business side. I was wondering, I guess, if you could expand a little bit more with these new social media platforms, such as LinkedIn. How do you, you know, build those relationships without being like sales, you push you, like you said, like how, like naturally, because again, I guess giving you my perspective, I usually reach out once. And if uh, the person is like not responding at all, then I just, I don't push it. You know what I mean? Like, should I be pushing it more and try and get them, you know, like you said, maybe multiple times before they respond? So I think, um, <clears throat> I think all I can do is tell you how it worked for me. I'm not mm -hmm. a social media uh, master, I guess you'd say, but um, the post, and you can go back and look, I haven't, I mean, LinkedIn is something that I only picked up really using solidly a, about a year before last, maybe. Um, I, I've been on here for a while, but but I decided to really start focusing. I was spending a lot of time on Twitter arguing about football um, or politics or whatever. And uh, and I was like, man, there's got to be a better way to, to use my time on social media and get with people that are like-minded like me. So I started, I started on LinkedIn. Um, but the post that really set everything into motion for me um, I, I love mentoring. It's why I'm here today. And, and, uh, I love helping people and, and I don't charge anything to do it. I help young people. Um, you know, Caleb Travis is a young guy on here that, uh, that I don't know if he's on the call today, but, but Caleb reached out to me and, and I've spoke with him several times and now he's, he's actually stepped away from his job and went into his own automation company with TNT automation and, and he's doing really well. And I'm, I'm tickled to death for him. Um, Mm -hmm. fantastic young man and i hope he i mean if anybody needs work done out there uh you know by all means look look him up because he's a, he's a good young man but anyway i do a, i do a lot of uh a lot of mentoring um and so one of the things i did when i got on linkedin is i realized i kept seeing the, the same thing over and over again I, people would ask young engineers would ask how can i afford the equipment to learn plc training because i mean let's be honest you know, if you're trying to do control logics and it's four thousand dollars for the software and then it's fifteen hundred for a processor, no one can afford that, right? right? Um, so so I made a post about Raspberry Pi and codices, right? And and I put in that post and I said, Hey, look, you know, I'm not a rich man, but if anybody out there and I, I had no idea how big this would blow up, yeah. but I said if there's young people out there who's interested, you know, if you can't afford to buy this, hit me up and I will do what I can to get you one. I will put it into your hands, I'll do what I can. So I gave away about, I don't know, $10,000, $15,000 worth of these things worth of, you know, I mean, I, like I, I ordered just gobs of Raspberry Pis, twos and threes, because I had all these people from all over, young, mostly young people who were saying, man, I would love this. I would love to be able to learn. And I told them, I said, you know, you can set this up. You can learn an IC, uh, you know, PLC system. And I'm not telling you to build a machine with it. But what I'm telling you is if you smoke it or you blow it up or you wire something backwards, it's 40 bucks. It's no big deal. You can, you know, you can fix it. And so I gave a lot of that away. But from that post, I received an un, unreal amount of outreach from engineers who said, man, we love what you're doing. That's awesome that you did that. You know, why don't you come talk to us? So the reason I'm telling you this is that I think if you do it the right way, if you get out there. Like one of the things I used to tell tell people is that if you if you focus on helping people and, and other people have said this before, if you focus on solving people's problems, then you won't have to worry about money, right? Because it's going to take care of itself. It's going to there, there's a I don't know I don't know what it is. It's it's a it's the fuzzy logic of life, I guess you would say. But as I started helping other people, then all of a sudden doors started opening. And when I tell people that LinkedIn last year, LinkedIn accounted for almost a million and a half dollars for me in new business last year. Um, and I actually made a post about it. And I asked people, is this normal? And a lot of people were like, well, first off, a lot of people call me a liar. Um, but I mean, that's, it is what it is. If you, if you don't want to take somebody's advice, I can't help if you're a hater. It is what it is. Right. But, um, but the way that all that come about was I haven't really ever reached out on LinkedIn and said, Hey, you know, would, would you mind working with me? Or do you want to talk to me? Would, can I come and see you? It's not really been that way. It's been much more organically, uh, organically driven by people who engage in my posts, and then I engage in their posts, and then and we build that relationship that way. So what I would tell you is, is you know, instead of kind of hammering out there, because you know, I'm sure your inbox is like mine. You're getting people. I get a ton of people from overseas that are looking for work or wanting to come to work, and and I get these all the time, and and I try to be cordial with them, but I let them know that you know, it's really hard to build a relationship when we can't 
even sit face to face with each other. Um, you know, but at the same time, some of the guys like Jordan Humphreys and some of these guys I speak with quite a bit on here, we've built relationships of just friendship talking about, you know, the mentoring stuff or talking about different posts. I mean, some of it's about food or about travel or whatever. And over, over time, you start getting into the same questions I was talking about earlier about football is, hey, what do you do or how do you do it? And sometimes it's me asking that and sometimes it's them asking me that. So what I would advise is don't give up on the social media. Just change the way that you do what you're doing to where you're providing info and providing more of a um, an experience to the end user. I mean, if you think about it, just like a, a movie producer produces a movie and that pulls you in and, the, and then the next time he puts a movie out, I mean, how many Steven Spielberg movies have you went and seen just because Steven Spielberg was the producer, right? So once you get on LinkedIn and you start producing content that is useful to people, your inboxes will start inevitably being filled with people who want to know more about what it is. And maybe you have a specialist. I, I mean, you know, we specialize in budget automation systems. I have had multiple people contact me and said, hey, you know, we see what you're doing with these budget systems you're talking about. We're looking for that kind of solution um, because we don't have a lot of money to throw at this project. Can you come look at it? So we get a lot of that. Um, the post I just made a couple of days ago where we helped the client, you know, get a line back up and going in, I think it was 13 days from the time that they, they grenaded the line, it, it burnt to the ground, and they called us and said, man, we're really in a bind. And we go in and stripped out a bunch of old 1960s DC stuff, built a new cabinet for them in four days, delivered it. And then spent all of last week, 20 hours a day putting it in. And because we had, there was no blueprints. There was no wiring schematics. There was no wire numbers. There was no wire colors that made any sense. I mean, everything about this, we had to trace every single wire in and out of the cabinet to be able to land it. I had to install a PLC into it, two PLCs actually. I started out with a Snyder M251 in it. Uh, and then I realized I didn't have the, the analog cards in stock that I needed. So I had to swap to an Allen Bradley. Um, but anyway, you know, we showed up and we had no idea when we hit their plant floor, we had no idea what we were going to walk into. All I knew was I threw everything I had in the truck, AC drives, DC drives, PLCs, modules, whatever. I threw it all in the, in the truck and we went to their site to get them up and going. So from that couple posts that we posted, I've had three people reach out and said, man, it's really cool that you're able to do that that quickly. Um, you know, would you come and talk to us about what else you offer and show us kind of what you're doing because we have times where at two o'clock in the morning we go down and we have nobody to call um i don't want to make a living doing two o'clock in the morning service calls but i will absolutely go meet with these people because it's a way of making linkedin work for me in marketing which is exactly what you should be doing so when you talk about reaching out to people and you don't really get a uh you, you don't really get any treadway with them you know i call it i call it being on a bicycle with no chain you're just pedaling as hard as you can pedal but you're not going anywhere um then you have to change up the way you're doing things. And one of the ways of doing that is to really shift your gears and start providing something for free. You know, if you think about it, look at it like this, the, the wealthiest people in the world or some of the wealthiest people in the world give their product away. Right. I mean, you got Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook and, uh, and I mean, even Eagle, even Google for the most part, they're giving their product away, which is the, the search engine and the functionality, Android, all that. They're giving that product away, but they're learning how to capitalize on it in other ways. So if you're on here giving your product away, which is, could be, uh, you know, training, mentoring, time, whatever, um, there's going to be inevitably conversation coming into play. You know, you have, uh, I guess you have, uh, what is it that, that actors say is that um, bad publicity, there is no bad publicity. You know, any publicity is good is good for you, even if it's bad. Um, I mean, you look at Charlie Sheen, that man is a, a deviant in pretty much every single way of life. Um, but at the same time, you know who Charlie Sheen is, right? So it, it's kind of that thing. So I would just tell you to get out there and focus more, focus more on building your brand as to what you do and what you offer and, and how you can help in whatever it is that you do, instead of so much trying to reach out and, and directly build those, you can't force a connection to happen. You know, it's just like in a marriage with, with a spouse. You cannot force that spouse to have that connection with you, but you can build that connection over a period of time, um, a little block at a time. And so that's how I would tell you to go about it is change your gears a little bit. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, yeah, James. Sure. Absolutely. I, I, I have a question, but it may very well end up 
needing to start with maybe a five, 10 minute introduction because it's not a straightforward question. Sure. Um, uh, my name is Dave Gruing. I've been in automation all of my life. I knew early on in high school that I enjoyed electronics. I went into the Navy. My first computer would weighed basically four tons and had 669 circuit boards in it and 225 servos, synchros and resolvers. And it actually shot rockets with pinpoint accuracy in, in storms on, on a destroyer. And I've been in the uh, automation industry since getting out of the Navy. Um, and my most recent, uh, recently was in the concrete ready mix industry for 26 years up until uh, middle of uh, December. And uh, I quit my job uh, for reasons I'm not going to get into. Um, and uh, don't regret that. I am actually set going to be so fresh into going into business for myself that I'm kind of basically expecting receipt of my LLC uh, request from the state uh, today or, or Monday. Um, and um, I have been doing relay and timer logic um for 26 years i'm very good at that I, I started out with uh smart relays i've done a lot of work with smart relays i've worked uh right now i'm working with ellen bradley uh 800 series and um i want to go out and here, here's the one thing that concerns me a little bit i'm not a, a an electrical engineer i I'm, i have my associate's degree in electronics and um it's kind of basically a little bit of a liability thing i'm a very good seller at, of of myself and of my service uh 95 percent of all the com customers that i've had in my last three companies that I've worked for in the last 26 years, love me. That's like 95%. Everyone has their 5%. Um, but I'm very good at selling myself and doing a good job and making sure that things work and they work for a long time. Uh, does it, it, and so I'm thinking about going and knocking, knocking on uh, electrical uh, companies um, and to see whether or not I and to show them some of the work that I've done in the past um, and uh, to uh, try and get myself out there doing uh, small jobs and not my, my credit is like 539 out of 550. I have money, I don't have a boatload of money, um, and I'm not going to go out and buy, buy, buy and get in debt with that little bit of, of uh, introduction to myself, uh, Frank or James or anyone else, anyone have any good advice for me? I have a question for you. Where are you located geographically? Irving, Texas basically Dallas Fort Worth. Yeah, one one piece of advice I was have would have is get to know the people around you and and if you can team up with somebody. Find somebody that you can even shadow to a degree. A lot of what I did in East Tennessee, same area James is in, uh, I connected early on with a couple of machine shops. And machine shops can make things and often they need very simple automation. There was one in Athens, Tennessee. I think James would know where that is. And, and they built like, now you would call them pokey oak machines. What they did, did is they built a fixture 
and they'd put something like a, a car door interior on it and they wanted to make sure that all the screws were in it and things like that. And this guy would build these assemblies and put sensors on the assemblies and you'd pull it down and put it on that car door and it would just check to see whether everything's there. That logic can be done on an 820 simply, right? Uh, Alan Bradley, a simple thing. And you would be low cost going in with a product like that. Now, not everybody uses those, you know, but in Irving, you're in the Dallas area. You know, you might even try talking to, uh, 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 what's his name at Intellic? Uh, maybe not Walker himself, but he's in Dallas also. So that networking and talking to some of those people in your geographical area, right where you live, and then they'll, you know, they know somebody and some of those people you may find on LinkedIn, you know, that are in the Dallas area, but get to know them first, which is what James was saying too. get, get to know. Yeah, them. And, and also, you know, I would add on there, don't short sell yourself on what you're good at and your ability. Um, you know, you said that you were really good with relay logic and that you're good with the older systems and stuff like that. I can tell you right now that that there is absolutely a market out there for people who need to maintain their older systems and they don't have the money or won't spend the money to go to a newer system. So don't try to um, I'm not telling you not to not to, uh, you know, bring your proficiency along in the newer stuff, but I would love to have someone at the other end of a phone locally to where when somebody calls me and because I mean, there's times where we get on presses and stuff like that that are from the 1940s that are nothing but relay logic and drum switches. And, you know, and I'm walking in like, this is, I was born 70 years after this was made, you know? Um, but so I'm, you know, don't forget what your specialty is. If you, if you have a, a 30 year career built on this knowledge, you're an asset to someone. The trick is finding who that someone is. Right. Um, for example, you know, I remember years ago, back when Cognix first become a, a vision system. Now, this was a newer technology, but I remember that that we were doing a project for Lear, and Lear wanted to uh, be able to detect colors. They had they had some seats that were. This is in their Oak Island plant in St. Louis. We did some work out there, and they had a, a certain seat for a, for a GM trucker van that the, the armrests and the seat had, obviously had to be the same color. But they had some colors that were so close that it was really hard for the human eye to tell the difference. So they wanted to put a camera system in to see this. And I remember making phone calls and stuff. And I found this is, like I said, vision was new. This was 1999, 2000, early, early in Cognix's world. And they wanted to have this done. Cognix couldn't get there. And they wanted me to do it. And I had no idea about cameras, right? None. Hadn't done anything with it. So I found a guy and I remember it was like 500 an hour to bring him out because he was one of the only ones in the country that had this, this ability. Right. And the reason why I'm saying that is because you may be one of the only ones left in your area that has this ability to work on this older stuff. And there's not a lot of it, but I remember a saying one time that um, it was, it was about buggy whips. It was a, a, a business phrase. And it said the last, the person who makes the best buggy whip, will be the last person in business making buggy whips. You know, there's not that many people making horse saddles now. When, when the horse was the main form of transportation, you had somebody in every town making saddles or you had a farrier in every town. You don't have that many now, but the ones who are left are very, very good at what they do. So don't sell yourself short on what your skill set is. Improve that skill set over time, but absolutely market yourself for what you are because there is a, there is a value to that. You've just got to find the right place to use it. And it might mean that you need to specialize not just locally or even in the state of Texas. You may need to, you may need to expand nationally, but you, you may need to specialize and say, I'm a specialist in old school, you know, old school relay logic and build your brand around that. I mean, at the end of the day, do you really care how you make a half a million or a million a year if you're doing something that you love? Does it have to be brand new PLC automation, the greatest thing on earth? Or can it just be I'm out doing what I enjoy every day as my own man in my own business and I'm doing what I know? We could very well at Appalachian Automation, we could become, uh, well, one of the things we did is we become a FANUC ASI. That just happened. We just started uh, becoming a FANUC integrator for the, well, not, I mean, not an integrator. We've integrated it for years, but we just become a partnership with FANUC robots, right? And 
we looked at several robot brands and stuff, but we decided to, to hang with what we knew. We've integrated those robots for a long time, and we decided we wanted to kind of hitch our wagon to, to them and run with it from there. But there's some things that we don't do. We're not a very big process controls company. We don't do SCADA work. We don't do data work. It's not our realm of expertise. But what we are competent at and what we do very well, that's what we market ourselves to. So I would tell you the same thing. Don't sell yourself short. Market at what you know, then add on and build. Because if, if you, it becomes really easy. Well, not really easy, but it becomes easy when you're making enough revenue out of what you already know that you're not having to, to really risk a lot then it becomes easy to go out there and get that brand new. I mean, there's brand new guys coming out of school right now that have light years more knowledge on, 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 you know, things like neural networking and AI and these things that I have no idea about They're I don't know. Them. I don't know. them, And I'm never going to know them because it's easier for me to hire somebody out of school that went through four years of this or that knows it really well than it is for me to try to learn it. So what I would tell you is focus on what, you know, do what your core is, Really brand yourself as knowing that and then add the pieces down the road that help you grow that other area of your business that you may want to, you know, branch off into. Um, that's the best thing I could give you from my side. I very much appreciate that, James. Thank you. Sure. Yep, absolutely. Anybody else? Anybody have any questions? John, it's good to see you here. Uh, John and I uh, met in a class and we did business uh, he referred me to somebody in Atlanta and, and uh, connected me with somebody down there. And I went down and did a, uh, what, what was that? It was a, I think it was a pharmaceutical company that needed integration of their Allen Bradley control logics and a building management system. Yeah, it goes That's away. right. That's right. I, I've got a lengthy background. I worked for Rockwell for some, some years and I worked for Siemens for like 15 years and, that's uh I've started my own business officially last year. However, I'm still full time employed by an engineering firm where I travel hundred percent, you know, so I fly every week uh to somewhere around the country. Um it's hard to find that work life balance, but uh but I would say um the most important thing is networking. Absolutely. I mean, that's a cliche, but um, when I'm given an opportunity and I may not have the resources or the bandwidth to do or perform, uh, I find it, I, I take I take something from the big companies where you can be a solution provider and you can you know, pull from your resources to feed them because it, it, it shows that you have offerings to, to others and that really pays dividends to you or it can. Um, that's, that's something that I found over the years that, that really makes a lot of uh, difference. Uh, Mr. Grew and I was, I was in the Navy too. Um, and that, that is, uh, probably one of the best things I ever did after coming out of high school. Um, so it led to, I've been in this business close to 30 years and I've seen a lot of progression of, of the old school things from the old Reliance electric days, you know, in the migrations over to, you know, when RS logics first came about and, and, um, also, you know, with my own company or with my, my daily, uh, my, my day job, so to speak, um, they give me a lot of freedom to, um, to perform, to, to get in the door of, of, of potential clients. And so doing a, being able to do a feasibility studies like pro bono for a, a day or so to go to a, a site, um, where we, we don't charge them anything, but we'll come evaluate their electrical and mechanical systems and we'll do we'll write a report. And if they find value in it, that can, that actually uh, does lead into possible work and things of that nature. Um, but this, this is a uh, valuable information, Mr. Dean and, and Frank, you guys uh, are awesome. I, this is, this is, having a community of people that do the like-minded things uh 
is so invaluable. You know, I've got a website, you know, I'm, I'm true measure controls, you know, however, LinkedIn has provided me with more, um, real world, uh, um, benefits than my website ever did, you know, so, uh, being able to network with others, um, that do this, like the, like a lot of the same things is very important. I have a business partner or, or two man uh entity and we uh I, I i would i won't turn down very much because not that i will try to do it all myself i'll feed it out to others and that just to me uh you're paying it forward and in, in, a, in a manner so thanks for hearing me babble but I, i've enjoyed listening to you guys yeah well i think you touched on something that that i've told people before um you know if you can become it's it's it this may not make any sense to people but if you can become become an industrial concierge that that becomes very valuable and what i mean by that is i have clients who will call me and they'll say man we just had a shaft break it's like a three inch shaft and we have no idea who can turn this thing down and weld it well that's not me i mean i, I own a machine shop but we can't handle something of that scale right we we do like little fixtures and and tooling for the end of robots and things like that. We don't have the equipment. So like you said, I'll, I'll refer that out to one of my friends that, that I know will take care of them, right? And and sometimes that's not reciprocal. Um, sometimes I, I've got people that I have sent hundreds of projects to. They've never sent me anything, but they still take care of that client. So I'm still seen as that role. And once you start providing that full service, guess what? When that client has an electrical need or a controls need, they're not going to call somebody else. They know you're the the number one phone, the number one thing in their phone book, you know. So, which I mean, oh, so I remember reading a report years ago. Um, I don't remember who it was in a book. I read a lot, but it was in a book, and it said something. It was about branding, and it said something like, "If you can't occupy, when somebody thinks of of business, if you don't occupy the first or second brand in their mind, you're forgotten about." So, if you think about anything. Um, soft drinks. What's the first thing? Well, Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, Pepsi. And then all of a sudden it gets harder to come up with that next one, right? And yours might be Snapple or something. I don't know. But if you do that with any brand, so if you talk about if you talk about vehicles, okay, so it's it's Ford, it's Chevy, it's Dodge, it's Mercedes, and then it's you see what I'm saying? So after you get two or three, the human brain can retain a certain amount of of branding for each item, potato chips, Doritos, Lay's, whatever. No matter what it is, you hold that. So your job is not to convince everybody to do business with you. Your goal is to simply convince people that you should be that number one or number two position in their brain. If you get that, then all of a sudden, as soon as something breaks, the moment like I've got, I've got clients. And, and one of the things I tell people is I have, I, I don't actually, somebody just asked, I was looking at the chat session and they ask about if I do any SEO or that kind of stuff. And, uh, or if it's all word of mouth. And, and for me, it is mostly word of mouth. I mean, honestly, my website is still not done. It's been like, if you go to Appalachian.com, AppalachianAutomation.com, it's going to say we're coming and it'll be here eventually. And eventually sometime um, it will. But the thing is, we've got such a core client base that we do work with that I don't have to market that much. My phone rings every day. And the reason why is because the moment that something breaks in those 30 or 35 customers that we have, the moment something goes down, the first thing that pops into their head is we got to call James and get this going. It's not we've got to call somebody or we've got to find somebody or we've got to deal with somebody. And it may be something like I get people call me for Siemens all the time. We are not a Siemens integrator. I don't integrate it. I don't know Siemens. I don't want to integrate Siemens, yet they'll call. So what do I do? I pass it along to somebody that I know that does Siemens work, right? So absolutely, I agree with what you're saying about, about using that. Um, solve problems every time you solve a problem with somebody you're building that rapport and the more even if you're not getting paid you you've got to stop the mentality everybody's got to stop the mentality of every dime and every penny matters because it doesn't it's about building a long-term relationship with that client and the money will eventually come um one of the things i'll give you a, a real quick example um but one of the things that that we do um is we we very uh consistently monitor over um going over a budget like we don't ask for change orders a lot 
okay? And and the reason why is because um, we believe that when you quote a job, even if the client is at fault, and now if you have to, if, if you quote something and then the client completely misses, you know, on what they spec, and then you get out there and it's not your fault, then you got to go for a change order. I get that. But to give you an example, this six month project that we just come off of from Toyota, um, it was it was a sizable project. It was up near seven figures. It was it was a big job, right? And at the end of it, I figured we probably had probably seventy thousand, eighty thousand dollars worth of time that we should have billed because it was work stoppage time. It was in our contract. And basically it was, if my contractors, if my guys, if my guys had to stand around and wait on them to do something, you know, turn on a, a breaker or turn on coolant flow from their ceiling because we weren't allowed to be in a lift or, you know, whatever. We were there for a very specific narrow window of work that we couldn't deviate from by their rules for their safety and all that, right? If we had to stand around and wait for any time, that was supposed to be billed. But I started looking at it, and I'm seeing all these other contractors that are going over budget by a long way, right? They, they were several contractors that, that were way over budget. And I'm thinking it does more good for me for the long term to forget about that $70,000. Now, $70,000 is still a lot of money to me. It's not, like, it's not like we're making so much that that's not a huge chunk, right? But when I looked at it, it it's like um, it's like when you're playing poker. Um you can break somebody in the first hand and take two or three hundred dollars away from them in the first hand, and, th and then they get up and leave. Or you can slowly bleed off three thousand off of them over the night by twenty dollars at a time, and they'll stay there and have a blast with you, right? So it's kind of that sort of mentality. So my mentality was, let's just forget that seventy grand, and let's show them that we provide value to them. And and it absolutely worked. Like I said earlier, if you wasn't here, you know, when the list come out on this new project that we're about to take on we were at the top of the list of who they should call first. And, and I tell people all the time that we don't compete on money. Like we don't compete. Everybody thinks they have to be the lowest cost. We are never, ever the lowest cost. We build budget systems, but we're never the lowest cost, but we still get, I close right now about 80% of the business that I quote, 80% of what I quote comes into the business in as, as, as it comes into us as business. That's because of two things. One, we have a very, very long relationship with our clients. We're not a big company, but we have a very long relationship with the 35 or so core clients that we have. They know that they're going to get a fair deal. And most of the time, they don't even bid things against us. But if they do, even if we're higher, they know what they can expect from us. So I got a call, and I don't even know how much this I'm supposed to be saying, but I got a call from, from Toyota Purchasing last week, and they said, we noticed that on your quotes for this job, you're about 15% higher than your competitors. And I said, yes, sir, we are. And he said, well, we need to remedy that. And I said, there is no remedy for that. Uh, I'm sorry. And he was like, well, you know, um, we don't really understand, you know, why you're so much higher. And I said, well, let me explain why I'm higher. Um, first off, we're going to come into your factory. And he was talking about using OEMs. They were talking about using OEM integrators to come in and start these machines up. And I said, well, those OEM integrators are going to come in and they're going to start their machine. That's it. And I said, if you think that we can compete with an OEM that knows the machine because they built the machine and they already made profit from selling you the machine, so they've already loaded some of their costs into the sale of the machine to start it up, I can't compete with them on a money-wise. I can't. But what I can do is I can tell you that I'm four hours away from your plant instead of a 30-hour plane ride. And the people who are coming to your facility are all senior technicians that will work on anything you ask us to work on. And... If there's 17 different manufacturers machines hooked together on this line that you give us, we will start up and integrate all 17 of those machines. So yes, I'm more expensive, but what you're getting from my team coming on site is going to be way more uh, capable for what you need to have done in the long run than, than you know, what you're going to get from the other side. That was the end of the conversation. It was done. The POs were cut. We were ready to go. I had to explain that though, because yes, we're more expensive. But what we're providing is more of a service. The engineers saw that right away, but purchasing couldn't figure out how we got passed through. And then, and we backed that up because we just come off of a six month project where we were ranked in the top when they did all their metrics. Cause you know, Toyota, they got a number for everything. So when we did all their metrics, they realized that, that everything that we promised, we provided, including as far as I know, and from what I'm being told, we were the only, we were the only company on site that come in under budget. 
And the reason we come in under budget is because I didn't bill that $70,000. So I didn't let a dime stop me from dollars, right? Because had I billed that 70000 and went over budget, then we looked just like the rest of them. But because we didn't bill that, I lost 70000 but now there's $6.3 million worth of work coming in the next two years that I hope that we're going to be considered for all of it. So keep that in mind is, is that you have to play the long game when you're doing that stuff. And then, you know, it'll all come out in the wash. Well, um, we're mostly toward the end of our time and we actually started very early. So I'm going to have an interesting time chopping this video up because we got some uh, gold nuggets there before we even started the webinar that I'll have to, uh, stick in here, but I'm going to go ahead and go to the last slide. Uh, I've really enjoyed it, James. Um, it, this has been, I think you've given a lot of really good nuggets of advice as, from a business owner standpoint. And as usual, lots of good stories. Uh, you should check out James YouTube. I don't know what your YouTube channel is, but um, Appalachian Automation. It is. Yep. Appalachian Automation has got a channel there. There's three or four videos. Um, those were filmed when I was in Huntsville on that project and, and I was by myself in a camper and it was cold every night. So I just kind of set the phone up and they're very rudimentary, but it goes in depth a little bit about, uh, you know, my philosophy on business and, and how I do things a little differently. Um, so check that out. And, and, you know, if anyone wants to reach out to me personally, um, I love having conversations. I spend probably 10, 12 hours a week with people on the phone. Um, just discussing how to build their business and how to help. Uh, I don't expect anything for it. What I will tell people, if you want to pay me back for anything that you get out of this, um, I, I don't, I don't want a penny from you, but if you would go to St. Jude's, uh, donate, you know, that that's a company that means a lot for me. So, um, if you wanted to, to really give back and, 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 you know, if, if, if I provide you something that, that ends up being a lot of business, um, you know, throw five bucks at St. Jude's, that would, that would mean a lot. Um, but I love to mentor, love to work. Uh, you're welcome to contact me anytime. If you want to message me on LinkedIn or uh, james.dean at AppalachianAutomation.com is my email if you want to drop me a line there. Um, be happy to work with you. The other thing, one thing I want to touch on before we leave, um, if, I can, if I can give anybody advice on how to get started in the industrial automation or in the electrical business is um, learn who your distributors are and understand that if you start building bonds with your distributors, um, it, it becomes beneficial to both of you. Like I said, I do a lot of work with Rexel. Um, they, they, those guys are like family to me. Um, there's some other distributors that I'm building relationships with. Graybar in Knoxville is one of them. Uh, those guys have really been fighting for my business and, and really been, uh, um, you know, hitting me up uh, quite a bit. Mike Blankenship out there, super, super nice guy. But basically, Get to know your distributors and work with them and don't be afraid to sit down with them as an integrator and talk to them about special pricing because what I see a lot of young integrators do or a lot of people getting started do is they don't understand that there's a set of pricing for end users and there's a set of pricing for integrators and a full a full 30% of our revenue on the company, granted, like I said, we're a three to a $5 million company. We'll top that this year. This year, we're going to be up close to probably around $7 million by the time the year is done. But about 30% of our profit from our company comes from components that we sell because we have a discount coming in. So I can still sell a component that um, – uh, take a Snyder PLC, for example. That Snyder PLC may have a list price of $900. And I've worked out pricing because we do so much with them of getting that for – $500. I can still sell it for $750. The client is getting a discount on the product, but at the same time, we're still making a profit. So make sure that you start building those relationships. And some of those distributors are going to want to see quite a bit of volume before they start really getting into that. But don't bounce around. Um, don't shop just price. Start. I mean, even if you've got to overpay a little bit, pick a distributor that services you very well, that, that, you, have a, that you can build a personal relationship with the sales guys there and that aren't trying to take advantage of you and start working on ways because a lot of those guys will love to help you grow your business because it, it's beneficial to them. Um, so, you know, I want to make sure and get that out. I know it, it's kind of the end here to, that we bring that up, but that needs to be in the conversation because it's, it's a very um, essential part of, of, a, of a systems integrator role is 
learning how to get profit out of things that normally don't seem profitable. Um, there's not very much that we touch as a business that we don't somehow profit off of uh, from one way or the other. And and if anybody wants to reach out, we I do a lot of things that that I won't take up a lot of time here with it, but I do a lot of things that are a little bit um, outside of the box thinking on getting you into the doors of clients, um, Vlad, like you were talking about. So So if you want to reach out to me, I can give you some ideas of some things that you can offer that not only is a product that you can sell to your clients, but that will help them get data that will put you in place to start doing some CapEx projects with them maybe two or three years from now. Because you've got to start those conversations early. There's projects that we're quoting now that won't be done for 20 till 2023. The money will be put in that budget then, right? But I've got I've got some things that I've come up with that I can teach you that will show you how to kind of get out there. And it's not just based around selling a product, it's based around solving, solving an issue. So I do some things like obsolescence audits that I can go into where we go in and we get paid to do the audit, but we go in and we let the client tell us what their most important piece of equipment is. They tell us what that piece of equipment is. And then we start at the top at the most important. And we go to that machine and we figure out everything in that machine and we give them an auditable, an audible report on what is going obsolete? What is obsolete? What is the end of life expectancy? Because you can get all that, like Snyder, Siemens, all those guys, they put out an end of life ex expectation of that product. That product's going to be end of life in 2027, right? Well, if you go out and you find their most important piece of equipment that they tell you is their most important piece of equipment, and then you go in and let their, their data drive you to solving their problems, you can hand them a report that says, okay, machine one, two, three, has these seven things that are near impossible to get. So here is a proposal to replace those. And this is what it's going to cost budgetary. Don't don't try to lock in on number, but say it's going to cost between 100 and 175,000, right? Give them a big number and then let them put that in their CapEx. And guess what? You've just rooted out everybody that's going to compete against you on that job because they've already got the report. They're not going to waste their time, most likely, quoting it with somebody else. They're going to come to you and say, hey, you remember that report you've done to us a couple years ago? We would really like to do item number seven this year. Can we start working on getting that nailed down on a formal quote? So there are some things like that that I can teach you that will really help you bring revenue through the door, get you out. And, and, and like that obsolescence audit, from day one, you start providing a service that the client can use right away that you don't, have to, you don't have to do a machine bill for them before you start showing your value. And it costs you nothing because it's literally some time and a piece of paper. You can do an obsolescence audit. It costs you a day's time or a week's time if it's a big company and 28 cents worth of ink. And you're turning it into a contract that could lead into hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have generated you know, probably a million, million and a half dollars off of just that alone since we started doing it about three years ago. So um, I can help with stuff like that. Feel free to hit me up. Um, I, like I said, I don't believe in competition. I believe in collaboration. Um, I don't hide things, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to share. We, we do enough business where we're absolutely swamped. We're not trying to grow larger than we already are. So if I can help you guys grow your business, I'm more than happy to. Well, James, appreciate it, James. It's been great to um, have you on, and uh, just want to announce real quick: the next webinar will not be on Friday. It'll be the first time I've had to skip that because I'll be on my way back from Miami and I'm going to try to do it on Thursday. I may try to have Jordan Humphreys on. Uh, he, he talks about, right, recruiting and getting jobs and all that kind of stuff. And that's an interesting topic. Um, but yes, reach out to James, if nothing else, on LinkedIn, right? Or, or at yep. the email address that I put up there before. I will be putting this on YouTube. It takes me a couple days. And again, I leave for Miami tomorrow morning. So I don't know. I, I may not get it up until Sunday or Monday, but uh, uh, check out this this YouTube channel here. I have a kind of a company channel in Automatic Eye. If you if you type in that name, you'll find me there also. And uh, I appreciate having you, uh, James. And good seeing some of the rest of you guys, Vlad and John and uh, Dave. Uh, this is I think second second one in a row you've come in and talked to us. So that's that's great. Um, but Thanks, I'm gonna go yeah. ahead and call it a day here. It's great. Seeing everybody. Uh, thanks, James. Yep. Thanks, Thank guys. Sure appreciate it. Thanks, James. Cool uh, backdrop. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm sitting at my kitchen table. Um, we are in the process of moving to a new facility, uh, or actually two new facilities. We just closed on two buildings, and uh, 
So right now I've got guys in my basement building cabinets. We've got 12 cabinets after ship today. So they're downstairs. I've got a about 3,000 square foot um, of, of basement space under my home. And uh, so they're they're down there wearing it out and working on that. And I told them, I said, be really quiet. Be really quiet. I, I got to have this this call. So they're hating me right now because they got to figure out how to drill and tap holes and be quiet at the same time. So. Well, I get but, sometimes uh, I get some cars running up the road and they make, you know, loud, brrr, you know, so you yeah. never know. <laughs> well, we shouldn't have to deal with any of that. We live at the, the back of a farm. Um, it's not our farm, but we get to enjoy the quiet, you know, serene peacefulness of it. You know, there's a, I see a lot of guys out there, um, and I'm not bashing anybody by any means, but I see people like uh, Grant Cardone, you know, those kind of people who are phenomenal salespeople and, and they do their, their job really well. And they do a lot of seminars and training and stuff, but man, it seems like they skip over the part from going from say 50,000 a year and actually being able to quit your day job and doing your thing. They, they skip all that in between, you know, they, they, they talk about, well, you'll follow our program and you'll make 20 million a year or whatever. And cause that's what they can sell. But to me, the, the part in the middle, you know, really matters to people. And, and they're like, how do I, how do I find that first customer? Or what do I do? Or how do I, how do I compete in this world? Or, so I wanted to take some time and, and, and share my experiences, both good and bad, on how we how we you know made that happen and how we uh, accomplished some of that through the years. And and uh, so that's what led me to do those videos. And and like I said, they were literally sitting in my RV on my phone. You know, no special editing or anything. I have no idea how to do any of that anyway. So, uh, but I wanted it to be real, and you know that was that was the goal. So. Well, and you, yeah, I thought it was great. You are very well spoken to me. You, you made all your points. You were, you know, uh, did, did you post it on YouTube or anything or? I did. Yeah. Yeah. I started up an Appalachian automation channel and I plan to do basically what you have sitting behind you. I plan on starting to do some training more on the technical side of things. Um, mainly when I train my guys, because we, we believe, we believe in bringing guys in and, and training them up. Um, you get a lot, a lot less of the, the prima donna syndrome when you bring somebody in and you and you teach them and you make them a part of the family. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a mafia boss here, but, but I like to bring guys in and and uh, you know take somebody who's really hungry to be more and help them achieve that goal. Um, you know, everybody that we have in the company and we're small. You know, there's there's six of us. Uh, we've got a total of about twenty when we count the repeat contractors that work with us on a steady basis and that kind of stuff so we're not big at all um and, and we probably never will be because i like the i like that we can essentially park the company for three weeks if we want to which is about what we're going to do starting august the first um i don't have any projects booked until the end of august so we're just going to go idle and the thing that i can do with that is i can still pay my guys their full salaries so that they can go, go enjoy time with their with their children or whatever before school starts back um we can't do that if we get to where we're 100 employees or 200 or whatever, and the overhead's just so high that I can't afford to have a lifestyle. And I don't want to be one of those business owners that the business owner has a great lifestyle, but his employees feel like they're they're hooked to the business all the time. So when when I'm off, they're off. Yeah. And um, you know, of course, we we're still on call and we still take emergency situations. Uh, you know, I just posted a, a few days ago about one that we just did for a client that that had a an old DC generator setup blowout um a couple weeks back it burnt to the ground and we had to get them back and going and and uh that has been a monster i mean for us it's been it's been a challenge but it's running and they're back to producing and they're happy um so during that off time we still take care of that kind of stuff and i still do the the role of you know sales and that kind of stuff but but i try to give my guys idle time especially when i know we've got a big project coming up uh in september we've got a several month long project that's coming up in west virginia um that's going to be just unreal as far as hours and stuff go so i really want to just give my time my guys some time to enjoy the family and do that sort of thing so okay i noticed you went to business school right you went to etsu i did i did i majored in corporate finance and investments um so and you know we'll hash a little bit about my background and how i ended up there in business school instead of a a, a technical background basically it revolves around the fact that i grew up in automation uh, my my dad had an automation company and um from the time I was about 12 years old, uh, he, he pitched me an Automation Direct 05 or 105 PLC, and that was my birthday gift, and he said, make it work. Um, and that was all the, only, the only info I got. You know, that was it. So, exactly. um, so you know, so I started there, and, and by the time I was 18, I was working with him and, and building cabinets and uh, 
you know, my senior year in high school, um, you know, I, I, I was I was in the six figures in earnings while I was still a senior in high school, just from from building and, and installing during the summer and working with him in the afternoon. So, so I didn't um, I didn't need to, to I didn't need the technical side, I guess per se, as much as I needed to know how to run a business. And uh, so I went to business school and and um, actually I, I never finished it. I never I never graduated with a degree. I, I went uh, for three years. Um, uh, about two and a half years actually and in the monotony of of the university just really got to me um you know i made a video uh, a while back i don't even know if i posted it to linkedin but i made a video um i had went and visited a, a spring here locally in east tennessee and, and i was talking about how we used to get our water from that spring when i was a kid um you know it's just this pretty much a mud hole in the ground but but like i said i grew up as you know i mean i grew up in a very poor area and and uh, my dad wasn't really in the picture um the first several years of my life I mean, he was he was there but uh my mom my mom carried the load and she worked at the factory and you know run a, a machine at a christmas paper factory um and you know one one thing led to another and and dad come back into the picture when i was uh you know in, in my preteens, like i said 10 11 12 right in there and uh, and he and i built a relationship later in life that that went on to to grow as far as business and you know family but um but yeah, so when I, I remember one day I was sitting in, in school and I was in some, you know, this art appreciation or something. I mean, it was just some ridiculous class that I would never, ever use, you know, and they, they want you to be well-rounded and I get it. I mean, I like my guys to be well-rounded too, but at that time I, I'm, I'm silencing phone calls that are coming through um, from clients needing work done. And I'm sitting here, you know, listening to some guy going about art or music or whatever the class was. And, and I'm thinking to myself, this is insane. What am I doing? You know, I've got the phone ringing off the hook with people wanting to hire me to do work. I know what my career path is. It's going to be an automation, uh, you know, and I even, I even, and, and we'll talk more about that shortly, but I'll even, you know, I even uh, went outside of automation a few times when I, when I wanted to learn to sell. Um, you know, I took a gig doing car sales and had no desire whatsoever to be in the car sales business, but I knew that they're probably some of the best closers in the world. Um, you know, I mean, it, you know, when you get in a high pressure car sales uh, job, you're going to learn to close. Uh, so I did that for about four months, five months. Um, went into real estate, got my real estate license. Same thing. I wanted to learn how to properly close a long, a long term deal. I still have my real estate license. I still do my own deals and stuff now. But but the basics of that was uh, was to learn the process of closing contracts and, and contract law and doing that. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer in life experiences as, as teaching. Um, you know, I've never shied away from jumping into anything that I didn't understand. Uh, you just have to, you know, get in and learn it. I, I'm not a vet or not a, a pro at, at any of it, really. I don't, I don't guess, but, uh, but yeah, so business school was, was, uh, an experience in more than one way. Um, it taught me to manage my own money and, and do some of that stuff and, and, and manage the business and understanding capital. You know, I started writing a book a few years back that I've, uh, someday I'll finish it. I think it's more of a memoir at this point than it was a book. It started out going to be something that, like we spoke about before, uh, you have a lot of authors who write these books for, um, you know, the blue collar workers and stuff. And then you've got these guys who write these books for people that somehow go from nothing to a multi. I mean, if you're a CEO of Google, you probably don't need to read a book about how to build a business, but that seems what everybody targets to write for, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I started writing this. It's just a, a basic financial, a business financial book that helps people understand capital and cash flow and those kind of things and how they play a role in what you do. Uh, but I'll probably, I mean, I have no idea if I'll ever finish it, but like I said, it's more of a memoir at this point about, about my life story, but maybe one day I'll get it out there. But.